Hello, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Okay, so I'm casting my screen. Last time we discussed basically about uh, operons, the introduction of operon. And we also spoke about CRISPR and repetitive extragenic palindromic sequences. And we also saw a video of CRISPR, if you guys remember. Right? So uh, what we will do today is we will try to understand more about operons in detail and also about uh, the transposable and non-transposable repeat sequences, right? So uh, the number of transposable and non-transposable repeat sequences which may be present in different prokaryotic organisms, that is not going to be the same. It's, it's going to differ, okay? And usually uh, what the amount of space that they occupy in the prokaryotic genome is normally less than 1%. But in some cases, they may uh, have a larger occupancy in the genome also, which could be greater than uh, the normal 1%. Like you can see that the genome of meningitis bacterium, Neisseria meningitidis, strain Z2491, it has over 3,700 copies of 15 different types of repeat sequences. And that collectively makes it to occupy around 11% of the 2.18 megabase per genome. Now that's a huge amount of space in the genome, right? Now, the second feature of prokaryotic genome is that there is no introns. I'm sure that you know the concept of intron and exon from your lower classes itself. You know that exons are basically considered to be the coding sequences, while introns are considered to be the gaps which are filling up the spaces between the exons, right? So there is a scarcity of introns that you see in prokaryotic genomes, okay? In E. coli K12, especially, there is no discontinuous genes at all, okay? And introns are very, very uncommon when it comes to bacteria and archaea, okay? So those, you know, that have been discovered as spacers, they either belong to group one, group two types of introns, and they are quite different from the introns that we normally see in the eukaryotic pre-mRNA. When the mRNA is formed in eukaryotes, we know that uh, it's called as the pre-mRNA because it has exons which is spaced by the introns, and th those introns have to be spliced off, and the exons have to be linked together and then you call it as the processed mRNA, right? So till then the mRNA is referred to as a pre-mRNA. So whatever introns you see in case of eukaryotes, they are, uh, you know, way different than what you would see in case of prokaryotes if in case introns are present because introns are normally very uncommon in prokaryotes. Okay, so uh, these group one and group two types of introns can fold into complex base pair structures that have the ability to self splice themselves so that they can remove themselves from the RNA transcripts. So you don't need any specialized splicing proteins over here. That's one of the uh, characteristic features of intron like structures that you see in prokaryotic mRNA. Okay. Some of these are also like transposable elements, they're able to move from one position to the another in the genome. And because they are autocatalytic, uh, you know, the insertion of one of these introns into a gene, it uh, does not affect the ability of the gene to be expressed because these zones, they will just splice themselves off and remove them uh, themselves from the, uh, you know, RNA. Even if they are moving from one position to the other, you need not worry. The gene expression is not going to be affected in any way because these ultimately, when the pre-mRNA is formed, they will... Uh, catalyze their own splicing and they will remove themselves from the RNA transcript. Okay. Uh, now, what is important to notice over here is that these introns are behaving like transposable elements, right? right? And uh, they are able to uh, basically move from one location to the other on the genome, but at the same time, they are not affecting the process of gene expression in any way. 
Now coming to operons. So we have already discussed last time that operon is nothing but a set of genes which may be involved in the metabolism of or one single type of metabolic pathway. Okay, so all genes which are present in that cluster are going to express components which are required for metabolism of the same component. That's what we refer to as operons. Okay, so operons are a group of genes that are located adjacent to one another in the genome with one or two nucleotides that may be present between the genes. Okay, and all the genes in an operon are expressed as a single unit, which means that if there are three genes in the operon, all three genes are going to be expressed together. So if you want to take example of a typical E. coli operon, then it is LAC operon, which is also called as lactose operon, which you have studied in 12th standard also. This was the first operon to be discovered, which contains three genes, which is involved in the metabolism of lactose into glucose and galactose, because lactose is a disaccharide, right? So we need to understand that organisms normally break down polysaccharides, disaccharides, oligosaccharides to the level of monosaccharides, because they act as the substrates for energy yielding pathways. So lactose operon basically is going to express those enzymes which are responsible for converting lactose to glucose and galactose. Now lactose is not a common component in E. coli's natural environment. So if you provide them with lactose, they will take some time before they start utilizing lactose. That's what we call as the lag phase. Why do we call it as the lag phase? Because this is the tenure when even though lactose is present, E. coli is not able to use it. Because E. coli will have to first express the enzymes which are required for metabolism of lactose and only then the lactose metabolism will begin. So when lactose is made available to E. coli, the lac operon is switched on. And if lactose is not available, lac operon is switched off. So please understand that once you make lactose available, lac operon will be switched on, all three genes will be expressed together, okay, and then the lactose metabolism will begin. So this also tells you that how genetic expression is tightly regulated even in bacteria. You do not express any genes until and unless it is essential. And that's why lactose operon becomes an example of an inducible operon. Why do you call it as inducible operon? Because it will express its gene only when lactose is made available. Okay, so lac Z, lac Y, lac A, these are the enzymes, these are the three genes that are present in the lac operon. Lac Z codes for a very important enzyme, which is beta-galactosidase, which is responsible for the actual breakdown of lactose into glucose and galactose. While LAC-Y codes for an enzyme called as lactose permease. Now, this particular enzyme is very much essential to transport lactose inside the cell because lactose is present outside in the external environment. So it has to be first taken inside. So to take it inside, you will need this particular enzyme, which you call as lactose permease. Okay. And lac A is transacetylase. Now transacetylase is basically that enzyme which sees to it that none of the, uh, you know, galactoside and its derivatives are accumulating in higher concentration inside the cell because that could lead to toxicity. So they do not allow any form of galactosides to accumulate inside the cell due to its high toxicity. So it sees to it that galactosides are eliminated out of the cell regularly to avoid the toxic effects. So beta-galactosidase is responsible for actual breakdown of lactose. Lactose permease is responsible for letting the lactose inside the cell because until and unless you let it inside the cell, the metabolism will not begin. And then you have transacetylase, which is going to be responsible to ensure that galactosides and its derivatives do not accumulate inside the cell in order to avoid the toxicity. 
Now, please understand that other forms of operons are repressible operons. Okay, wherein you will see that uh, the gene products normally will try to control the process. मतलब अगर enough of the pathway has been carried out and enough of uh, the product has already been formed, the product will say that now no more production is required. We are available in a, you know enough concentrations. So let us stop the operon from expressing itself. So, जैसे inducible operons हैं, जैसे repressible operon भी होते हैं. Tryptophan operon, which is also called as trip operon, is one such example. Now, tryptophan operon is that operon which is consisting of five different genes which code for enzymes which are required for synthesis of tryptophan, which is an amino acid. Which is synthesized from the corismic acid. So corismic acid to tryptophan has five steps. It needs five different enzymes. Now please understand that if there is enough concentration of tryptophan inside the cell, tryptophan itself will block this operon from expressing itself. So this becomes a repressible operon. because the product of the process itself is inhibiting the operon from expressing itself but when tryptophan levels are low then you will see that the operon is expressed so that enzymes are produced and the biosynthesis of tryptophan can be achieved but if tryptophan levels are high then the operon is going to be in the switched off mode now let me tell you that There are around 850 different operons which are characterized in K12 E. coli K12 strain till now. 450 of these operons contain two genes each, and the longest of the operon contains around 18 genes. So you can imagine that how systematically nature has designed these organisms to function in an effective way. So this is an image of tryptophan operon wherein you can see that there is trip A B C D E gene all of which codes for enzymes for converting corismic acid into a very essential amino acid which is tryptophan Now operons is a very common feature of most prokaryotic genomes with over 2000 operons in some species but you cannot universally expect this that organisms should have operons like lactobacillus helveticus h10 strain they have 2052 genes but the number of operons present in them clusters of genes present in them functioning for same metabolic activity is very low it's just 35 and the longest of the operon in them uh, in in them consist of only 6 genes pseudomonas syringae dc3000 strain it has 5619 genes but cluster of genes that is operons is just 25 one of which contains 18 genes marine bacterium rhodopyrolula baltica it has no operons at all but it has 7325 genes so you need to understand that it's not at all necessary that all bacterial species will have operons they may have individual genes excess number of individual genes but it may be possible that they have either very low number of operon systems or no operon present at all even that is possible once upon a time you know it was it, i had mentioned this in the earlier lecture also that people thought that operon ke concept exclusively prokaryotic genome ka hai कहीं और तुमको ये दिखेगा ही नहीं सिर्फ प्रोक्यारियोट्स में ही दिखेगा बट ऐसा नहीं है आज ये पता लगाया जा चुका है सिंगल यूनिट which have been found in c elegans which is a worm and also some examples are seen in our fruit fly which is drosophila melanogaster now we come to a concept which is the last concept of prokaryotic genome which is genome size and number of genes please understand that 
there is some overlap in size between the largest prokaryotic and smallest eukaryotic genome but if you see the prokaryotic genomes are much smaller in size than what the eukaryotic genomes are e coli k12 ka example le lo uska genome 4.64 megabase pairs it is 2/5 the size of the yeast genome you can imagine how huge yeast genome would be and how small e coli genome is going to be and it has around 4315 genes most of the prokaryotic genome they are less than 5 megabase pairs in size but the overall range you know is uh you you could see that in in some organisms it it could be just 112 kilo base pairs and in some it could cross that 5 mega base pair and go to 14.8 mega base pairs also just say example diya hua hai nocio uh, delto cephalonicola it has 112 kilo kilo base pair which is the smallest size while sorangium cellulosum it has a very large size so the majority of them are in that size range of lesser than 5 mb there are exceptions is what we are trying to say over here now have a look at this very interesting you see the size of the genome and the number of genes present for nausea you can see 0.11 mb is the size 169 genes mycoplasma you can see 0.58 mb 559 genes streptococcus pneumoniae to mb 2228 genes 4 mb genome in vibrio cholerae 4113 genes 4.41 in mycobacterium tuberculosis 4096 genes e coli k12 4.64 megabase pairs 4315 genes Pseudomonas aeruginosa, you can see six point two six, five thousand eight hundred and seven genes, and Sorangium cellulosum fourteen point seven eight megabase pairs, ten thousand four hundred and seventy three genes. Archaea, you have Methanocaldococcus genasci, which is one point seven four MB, one thousand eight hundred and seventy five genes, two point one eight MB in Archaeoglobus fulgidus. Uh, 2515 genes so you can see that as the size of the genome is increasing the number of genes that you are seeing there is also increasing now the compact organization of e coli k12 genome with the genes making up 89% of the genome let me tell you that the average gene density in any genome is 87% the rest is going to be junk genes i mean we don't know what they do as yet but the known genes they tend to occupy average 87% of the genome size this means that you can say that the genome size is proportional to the number of genes present because the junk dna is very low this may not be the case with eukaryotes eukaryotes may there will be a lot of junk okay but the genome size is going to be proportional to the number of genes at least in case of prokaryotes the number of genes vary over an extensive range and that obviously reflects on what kind of ecological niche the organism lives in बिकॉज जिस काइंड के नीच में वो रहता है और जितना काम उसको करना पड़ेगा उसके हिसाब से उसके पास नंबर ऑफ जीन्स होंगे सो इफ एन ऑर्गेनिज्म हैज टू सर्वाइव इन अ स्ट्रेसफुल एनवायरनमेंट इट विल हैव अ लॉट ऑफ जीन्स व्हिच विल हेल्प इट डील विद द स्ट्रेसफुल कंडीशंस सो द लार्जेस्ट जीनोम्स टेंड टू बिलोंग टू फ्री लिविंग स्पीशीज दैट आर फाउंड इन सोइल द एनवायरनमेंट दैट यू नो नॉर्मली हैज अ लॉट ऑफ फिजिकल एंड बायोलॉजिकल कंडीशंस and the organisms are expected to respond to these conditions they obviously will have n number of genes present in them so their genome is going to be largest so sorangium cellulosum is the best example it has 10400 protein coding genes some of these are enzymes which are responsible for helping this bacterium to break down cellulose as the name suggests cellulosum they have the ability to break down cellulose into sugars and use those sugars for energy 
Some of these genes also code for enzymes that will synthesize antibacterial, antifungal compounds so that it can compete with other organisms in the soil ecosystem. Because see, whenever there is food available, and if the food is available in lower concentrations, organisms normally tend to compete. Ki kaun zada khana khayega? And is chakkar me wo apne competitors ko maar dalne ki koshish karte hai. Kaise maarenge? By producing antibacterial and antifungal agents so that the others will not be able to survive. And they will get all the resources that is available. So there have to be genes which also help them to code for enzymes which are responsible for producing these antibacterial and antifungal agents. There are also genes for proteins which are involved in cell to cell communication, which enable the bacteria to migrate, to swarm, to form fruiting bodies, to produce resistance spores. Right? And you will see that the smallest genome they belong to organisms which act as parasites and it is obvious no because if a bacteria is going to act as a parasite it doesn't have to metabolize anything it's going to get everything ready made from the host so they don't have they, there is no necessity of having you know a lot of genes because they are going to get most of the products in the broken down format so it's best for them right so if you talk about nausea delto cephalonicola which is an endosymbiont of leaf hopper which is an insect so it lives in the insect's abdomen within some specialized organelles within some specialized structures so there these organisms will be able to uh, you know survive as a parasite Okay, and utilize all that is being metabolized by the leaf hopper. But in return, these bacteria may also provide the leaf hopper with some essential nutrients. Like in this case, this bacteria provides two amino acids that nausea can produce, but the insects cannot produce. They will have to obtain it from their diet. So nausea can help them by providing with these two amino acids, which the insect cannot produce on its own. So it could be a give and take relationship. Okay. While in return, the bacteria is going to get nutrient from the insect, right? So we need to understand that it's a give and take relationship. So nausea's genome is very small because it's acting as a parasite. It's like just one thirty-seven protein coding genes, the majority of which are actually involved in some essential functions like DNA replication, transcription, translation. but not for metabolism because it is getting everything ready made from its host so uske survival ke liye uske multiplication ke liye jo enzyme zaruri hai sirf utne hi genes uske genome mein present hone wale are you understanding all this are you with me any questions till this point please feel free to ask can i see a yes or no in the chat box at least so that i know that you are with me and there are no questions if no questions then type no theek hai okay now you know because of genome sequencing technology that has come in the genome of different prokaryotes obviously has been sequenced and people have started comparing it right so the number of genes what is the smallest number of gene that a bacteria would need to to live as a free living cell this can be identified by comparison by you know by establishing a comparison between the genome of different prokaryotic organisms so mycoplasma genitalium it's a free living organism and it is seen that the number of genes that it has is only 476 okay and what it did was they introduced mutation in some of these genes and they saw that only actually 382 genes were essential out of the 476 genes for this organism to survive 382 okay so rest of almost you know a uh, 100 set of genes were actually not needed for the survival so by genome sequencing data and by actually introducing mutation scientists have been able to identify that 
382 जीन सिर्फ जरूरी है इस बैक्टीरिया को सरवाइव करने के लिए दैट्स द मिनिमल सेट ऑफ जीन दैट इज रिक्वायर्ड यू कैन डू दिस काइंड ऑफ स्टडी विद अदर बैक्टीरियल जीनोम्स आल्सो वेयर इन यू ट्राई टू इंट्रोड्यूस म्यूटेशन एंड फाइंड आउट दैट व्हाट इज द मिनिमम नंबर ऑफ एसेंशियल जीन्स दैट दे रिक्वायर विच कुड बी स्पीशी स्पेसिफिक क्योंकि माइकोप्लाज्मा में 382 था इसका ये मतलब नहीं है कि ईकोलाइ में भी 382 ही होगा या बैसिलस में भी 382 ही होगा कई बार जो सर्वाइवल रिलेटेड जीन्स होते हैं वो स्पीशी स्पेसिफिक भी हो सकते हैं सो यू विल हैव टू फर्स्ट सीक्वेंस द जीनोम आइडेंटिफाई द टोटल नंबर ऑफ जीन्स प्रेजेंट देन इंट्रोड्यूस म्यूटेशन इन दीस जीन्स एंड ट्राई टू आइडेंटिफाई दैट व्हाट इज द मिनिमल नंबर ऑफ जीन्स दैट इज रिक्वायर्ड फॉर द सर्वाइवल ऑफ दिस ऑर्गेनिज्म सो इन सम स्पीशीज इट कुड बी सीन दैट इट इज ग्रेटर देन 382 इन सम इट कुड बी मच स्मॉलर देन 382 Like in one project, it was identified just two thirty genes are sufficient for the growth of Salmonella typhi muria, provided that you are growing the strain in a rich culture medium, wherein they could get all nutrients which are required for it to grow, including amino acids. Two thirty genes are enough. Okay. So we have to understand that जितना तुम उस ऑर्गेनिज्म का काम कम करोगे जै, जैसे कि नेचुरल एनवायरमेंट में रेडीमेड खाना मिलता नहीं है तो उनके पास सारा मैकेनिज्म होना चाहिए मैक्सिमम न्यूट्रिएंट्स को खुद से सिंथेसाइज करने के लिए तो जितना खुद से सिंथेसाइज करना पड़ेगा उतना जीन्स बढ़ते जाएगा इसलिए नेचुरल एनवायरमेंट में जो तुमको ऑर्गेनिज्म दिखेंगे जो फ्री लिविंग ऑर्गेनिजम्स है उनके पास नंबर ऑफ जीन्स नॉर्मली ज्यादा होते हैं क्योंकि उनके पास काम भी ज्यादा है क्योंकि खाना मिलेगा इसका भरोसा नहीं है तो न्यूट्रिएंट्स को बनाने पड़ सकते हैं बट अगर वो एक पैरासाइट है जिसको पता है कि उसको खाना रेडीमेड मिलेगा तो उसमें जो नंबर ऑफ जीन्स आपको दिखाई देंगे दैट इज श्योरली नॉट गोइंग टू बी हाई नंबर सो द जिनोम साइज एंड नंबर ऑफ जीन्स वुड बी वेरिएबल इन इंडिविजुअल स्पीशीज सो वी हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट वंस द जिनोम इज सीक्वेंस ऑफ अ स्पेसिफिक ऑर्गेनिज्म you will have to actually sit and see that which number of genes are actually essential for its survival and you know with taxonomy in bacterial world it has always been very very difficult to classify the microorganisms you know morphological terms mein hum classify to karte hue aaye hain structural features ko dekh ke hum classification karte hue aaye hain but genome sequencing ke baad jo classification ka tarika aaya hai That has really become very difficult. आज तक जो क्लासिफिकेशन है वो स्ट्रक्चरल फीचर्स पर बायोकेमिकल टेस्ट के बेसिस पर जहां पर बर्जीज मैनुअल का इस्तेमाल किया जाता है टू सी दैट वॉट आर द मेटाबोलिक फीचर ऑफ अ बैक्टीरियल स्पीशीज देन यू आइडेंटिफाई विद स्पीशीज इट बिलोंग्स टू बट विद जिनोम सीक्वेंसिंग टेक्नोलॉजी पीपल हैव स्टार्टेड यूजिंग दैट एज अ वे ऑफ क्लासिफिकेशन एंड लेट मी टेल यू दैट इट हैज लेट टू इवन मोर कंफ्यूजन Now, why has it led to even more confusion? Let us see that. So, E. coli का example देते हैं. E. coli में multiple strains हैं. E. coli के ही multiple strains हैं. कुछ E. coli के strains completely harmless हैं, तो कुछ extremely dangerous और fatal हैं. So, ये समझ नहीं आता कि एक ही organism के strains में इतना variation कैसे आ रहा है? So, यहां पर स्पीशीज का कॉन्सेप्ट रीडिफाइन करना पड़ेगा क्योंकि एशरिशिया कोलाई में ही मुझे इतने स्ट्रेन दिखाई दे रहे हैं जिनमें इतना पैथोजेनिक वेरिएशन है सो एवोल्यूशनरी फीचर्स में इतना ब्रॉड चेंजेस जो आ रहा है उसको हम कैसे स्पेसिफाई करेंगे सो so, सिर्फ बायोकेमिकल या फिजियोलॉजिकल प्रॉपर्टीज या फिजिकल कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स के मदद से माइक्रो ऑर्गेनिज्म को क्लासिफाई करना डिफिकल्ट होता जा रहा है एंड द वर्स्ट इज दैट द जेनेटिक ट्रांसफर विच टेक्स प्लेस विद इन दीज ऑर्गेनिज्म इज इम्पॉसिबल टू कंट्रोल यू माइट हैव हर्ड ऑफ दीज थ्री टर्म्स ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन ट्रांसडक्शन एंड कॉन्जुगेशन ये तीन ऐसे प्रोसेसेस है जिससे ऑर्गेनिज्म एक दूसरे के साथ जीन्स शेयर कर सकते हैं जेनेटिक मटेरियल शेयर कर सकते हैं नॉट जस्ट विद इन द स्पीशीज अक्रॉस द स्पीशीज अक्रॉस द जीनस एंड इवन दीज डेज जेनेटिक ट्रांसफर हैज बीन फाउंड अक्रॉस किंगडम्स 
so when this kind of gene transfer is taking place it is going to be so difficult for me to classify the organisms and with genome sequencing it has become even more difficult because we find so many variety of genes some of them are similar between organisms and some of them are distinct and within the same organism i take two different strains of e coli i see that again there are different sets of genes so classification becomes a headache so two strains of helicobacter pylori which causes gastric ulcers and other diseases of the human digestive tract when it was compared in united kingdom and united states it was seen that the genome was 1.67 and 1.64 and we respectively not very uh, you know not very great difference in the genome size the initial annotations identified 1552 genes in the larger genome and 1495 in the smaller one with 1406 genes being present in both the strains which means that 6 to 9% of the gene content was unique to each of these strains rest of the genome were similar genes now let us discuss about e coli k12 and e coli o157 h7 now e coli k12 is a laboratory strain completely harmless well e coli o157 h7 is a pathogenic it's a lethal strain could also lead to hemorrhage now the length of these two genomes is significantly different for k12 it is 4.64 mb and for o157 h7 it is 5.59 lot of difference in size extra dna is seen in pathogenic strain which means that it codes for virulence factors through these extra genes which it possesses now these extra genes which are called which we are calling as o islands they contain 1300 genes which are not present in k12 now that's a huge number of genes which we are coding which we, which we are mentioning over here which are present in the pathogenic strain we call those genes as o islands which are absent in k12 these genes are coding for toxins and other virulence proteins which are involved in pathogenic properties in establishing an infection right now please understand that similarly even k12 has extra genes 234 segments of its own unique dna though they are smaller than the o islands but they are containing around 500 unique genes which is present just in k12 and not in O one fifty seven and so. So this makes us understand that each of these strains have their own unique strain specific genes. So for O one fifty seven and seven, it's around twenty five percent of the genome. But for K twelve, it's twelve percent of the genome, which which is strain specific genes, which you will not find in the other strain. It's only found in there. So this shows that there is more variation, right? And that makes it difficult. That how do we club both of these strains to be of the same species of E. coli? Because there is a lot of variation that you can see. So that makes the concept of classification a difficult task to achieve. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I think. did the presentation just stop can someone tell me that yes sir it, did it just stop or was it visible till this time it just stopped okay thank you so there are some terms which we need to know okay so let us see what those terms are so the difference in genome size and gene content which occurs within a prokaryotic species that has led to this concept of pan genome according to this concept there are going to be some set of genes which are common between the strains of the same species 
and there are some genes which are going to be unique to those traits so some is a common hoga aur kuch hissa unique hoga so the core genome is that set of genes which is possessed by all members of the species which means they are common set of genes so we call it as core genome to us species ka koi bhi strain ho unke paas wo gene hoga hi while those additional genes which are unique which are distinct to that particular strain only you call it as accessory genome so you can see here in this particular figure you see that the common set of genes is shown at the center because it is shared by all the strains of that species we call it as the core genome and their unique genes are shown out because they are distinct to them they are unique to them we call it as accessory genome so using the core gene you know you can identify if these strains are belonging to the species or not and using the accessory genome you can identify the strain so core genome is responsible for helping you to identify the species while the accessory genome is responsible for identifying the strain so using the basic biochemical tests cellular activities which are coded by for the nor normal core genome genes you can identify the particular species but accessory genome normally tells you about the complete biological capability of the species and it's going to help you identify the strain so the conventional view tha genome ka aaj tak that has been redefined with this pan genome concept and first pan genome concept was described in an organism called as streptococcus agalactiae this organism comes under the category of lactic acid bacteria it is found in the human gi and genito urinary tract that is the gastrointestinal tract and the genito urinary tract some of these are completely harmless strains while some of these are very pathogenic strains. pathogenic strains can cause severe urinary infections in adults and in newborn children it can cause some life threatening infections which means it could be fatal so a comparison of genome sequences of eight isolates of streptococcus agalactiae revealed a pan genome of 2700 genes 2700 genes jisme se 1800 gene jo hai wo core genome ka hai aur 900 jo hai that is making up the accessory genes within the accessory genes 260 were single turn genes which means that these are those genes which are found in one strain and the remainder were unique for the two or more strains 260 were unique to one single type of strain within the accessory genes so 900 me se 260 genes ek specific streptococcus agalactiae strain ke liye unique the aur baki ke were seen in two or more other strains some will be seen in combination but 260 of those genes were unique only to one strain not found in any other strain so it was clear that you know this is going to this kind of data that is generated as to how many number of genes are there in core and accessory genome that helps you to have a proper data which helps you to identify the species in strain effectively okay now please understand that the size of the core genome you know it is expected to go down as strains were discovered that lack one or more genes which were previously assigned to the core set which means that it has been noted that kafi baar accessory genes zyada hote hain aur core genes jo hai wo kam hote hain in organisms so jitna tum strain specific study karne jaoge tumko ye realize hoga ki accessory genes ka number zyada hai और कोर जीन्स का नंबर जो है वो कम होते जाता है बट ये जो 
study hai this is correct for few species not for all okay so organism to organism ye vary hota hai ki kitna core gene hoga aur kitna accessory gene jaise e coli plant genome agar consider karo so 60000 gene hai total plant genome okay और कोर जिनोम अगर तुम इकोलाई का देखोगे इट हैज बीन स्टेबिलाइज और उसमें ज्यादा चेंजेस नहीं हुए करीब 3188 जीन्स बिलोंग टू द कोर जिनोम ओके बट यस उसके एक्सेसरी जीन्स ज्यादा है और नए एक्सेसरी जीन्स आते जा रहे हैं ये जितना और नया स्ट्रेन आ रहा है इकोलाई का हम देख रहे हैं कि नए एक्सेसरी जीन्स एड होते जा रहे ओके सो You have to understand that the core genome may have stabilized. मतलब ना उसका नंबर बढ़ रहा है ना उसका नंबर घट रहा है एक्सेसरी जिनोम बढ़ते जा सकते बट कुछ स्पीशीज में कोर जिनोम का नंबर बढ़ते या घटते हुए दिखाई दे सकता है सो स्पीशीज टू स्पीशीज ये चेंज होगा ऑर्गेनिज्म टू ऑर्गेनिज्म ये चेंज होगा फॉर सम स्पीशीज पैन जिनोम इट सेल्फ इज क्लोज विच मीन दैट ना कोर जिनोम का साइज बढ़ रहा घट रहा है ना एक्सेसरी जिनोम का साइज बढ़ रहा घट रहा दैट इज आल्सो पॉसिबल बैसिलस एंथ्रेसिस पैन जिनोम इज 2985 आउट ऑफ व्हिच 2893 फॉर्म द कोर यानी कि सिर्फ दो एक्सेसरी जीन्स है वहां पर और ये पैन जिनोम टोटली क्लोज्ड और स्टेबलाइज्ड है यहां पर ना और एडिशंस हो रहे हैं ना डिलीशंस हो रहे हैं ओके okay? और वो अपने इकोलॉजिकल नीच को पूरी तरीके से अब अडेप्ट हो चुके हैं जिसके वजह से ना उनमें हमको कोई नए जीन्स दिख रहे हैं और उनका पूरा पैन जिनोम क्लोज है स्टेबलाइज्ड है क्योंकि दे आर लिमिटेड टू एन इकोलॉजिकल रेंज ओके एंड दे आर फाउंड ओनली इन दैट स्पेसिफिक इकोलॉजिकल सो दिस बेसिकली मार्क्स द एंड ऑफ आर प्रोकैरियोटिक जिनोम and we will now be stepping into eukaryotic genome wherein the focus is more going to be on the human genome wherein the study is going to be on a similar aspect as to how the human genome is organized in the form of a nucleosome what is the genome size and the number of genes we will also take example of some eukaryotic genomes other than human genome if possible to see the genome size and compare it there are some terminologies which are used when it comes to human genome we will be focusing on that so that we will start from our next session i will put the entire presentation of prokaryotic genome on the wiki i will also put up now all the videos for prokaryotic discussion and next week we will take a test on prokaryotic genome okay next week this week i did not get time but next week we will take an mcq based test on prokaryotic genome theek hai so pa brown kholo padhna chalu karo ye ppt mein upload karta hu isko as reference rakho and start preparing for that any questions till this point anything that you would want to ask Okay then we can stop at this point please start reading